I want to start with you. Do you think that Keller got out of the pit in prisoners? Yes. Yes. It feels pretty clear to me. I've got to be honest. People say that to me all the time. I'm like, the last frame of the movie is him turning when he hears the whistle. For sure. We actually shot, we shot the scene. Uh, it was in the script. We shot the scene of him coming and telling me the news about my daughter. And then in the end, everyone thought, well, then everyone's going to be like, it's not, there's no, like, it's a weird ending because he's going to jail for 20 years. So it's sort of like, oh, well, so <laughs> I think that's what, from memory, that's, that's what happened there. But people say that to me all the time. I'm like, yeah, he did. I agree as a viewer. No, no, I, I think so as well. But people like to know, they like to, you know, anyway, moving on. Lisa, my question for you is, um, do you sleep? Because you have a family, kids, and multiple projects and I really want to know how you pull this off. And she plays a piano like a fiend. Just FYI. I don't sleep. I defeated the need for sleep when I had children. I was like, now I have, it was like how I want Hugh to clone himself. I now have night me and day me. And then, and then there's no, I get like maybe three hours a night. I, Do you ever sleep more than that? Do you ever get like a, like a crazy go for 15 hours sort of catch up thing? No, because if I if I'm not working, then the kids are like jumping on top of me. There's never there's more never more than like three or four hours. I am aging exponentially quickly. <laughs> uh, Hugh, I'm I'm curious. What is the secret to maintaining your voice when you are performing eight performances a week? Ah, uh, live like a monk. Basically, live like a monk. I uh, I'm really boring. Well, devil tell you, I'm I'm boring a lot of the time. But I never go out after the show. I make sure I sleep, drink a lot uh, of water, not the other drinking, unfortunately, except Sunday nights. Um, and I still have a singing lesson once a week and do proper warm ups, warm downs. Like, it's just, unfortunately, there's no easy road around it. Lisa, jumping back to you, I read something, and I need to know if this is true, that of the way you broke into the industry, you were studying to like the, you wrote a spec script. Can you talk about how you broke in the industry? Yeah, I was, um, I had uh, been sent to law school by this company, McKinsey. And um, when I was studying, but I had to go back to be a management consultant for them to pay off my law school debt. So while I was studying for the California bar, I completely panicked and was like, it was mostly about pantyhose. I was very concerned that I would have to wear pantyhose for the rest of my life in like an Ann Taylor suit. And like those like just asphyxiate your crotch. They're just so uncomfortable. And I don't think people wear them as much now, but they did. And in my desperation to avoid a life consigned to pantyhose wearing, I, I wrote um, my first uh, TV script. And then I wanted to be an assistant, but some weird thing happened where they, um, they staffed me. And I found out when I was on a study in, in San Francisco, I was, I was working in high tech at the time which I guess came in handy for Westworld and such, but um, I had to quit on the spot and come back. And then I had to, I had so much law school debt, but I managed to pay it off like two years ago. <laughs> two years ago. It was about two years ago that I paid it off. Night Lisa wrote and day yeah. Lisa was at McKinsey. Yes, exactly. And I wrote mostly poetry until Jonah got me software and was like, you're never going to make a living off of poetry, which is, which is unfortunately true. Yeah. If I could, very inelegantly segue for re reminiscence is quite poetic so there you go it is it is when we're following your voice it could have been less poetic <laughs> <laughs> i remember by the way the first time we cut the trailer when we we hadn't sold the film yet and we put together a sizzle for berlin and you know we had all these like artwork and concept art and my team and i were looking at it and then hugh was kind enough to record the voiceover for it and there was just like swooning in the halls they were like what how does his voice alone just do that it's just elevated i was like that's because he's hugh jackman and he's like doing the thing this is the whole reason why we need hugh jackman so it was more than prima said not <laughs> I, I promise last question before we're going to get to uh the film which i have a, a ridiculous amount of questions um hugh i'm curious you you play in a lot of films you've played a lot of obsessed people and uh you've given a lot to your performances what was the toughest one to let go of, the toughest character to let go of 
after you wrapped filming? Like in terms of, you know, because I'm sure some of who you play comes with you um, home at the end of the day, or maybe I'm completely wrong. Blame is, blame is right. I think there was something so uh, about the process, it was very intense. And as the title suggests, it's not many, many happy scenes in it. So, um, and it just was a really deep place. I would say Les Mis was the hardest. I, I'm not a method actor by any stretch, but I think that was the one that was hardest to just get back into normal life. When you were, when you were done shooting Reminiscence, did you go home to Deb and talk in voiceover? Tonight, we're searching for turkey meatloaf. Yes. <laughs> it's gonna be great. Follow my voice. It's slowly, slightly <laughs> lower. <laughs> that could be, uh, my mind was going somewhere that I'm actually not gonna say. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that I love about this movie is that it's an original piece of IP. It's not based on existing material. It's not a sequel. It is really hard to make these movies nowadays. Lisa, how the F did you pull this off? <laughs> uh, just add Hugh Jackman. <laughs> That's going to be my answer to everything. I mean, Hugh, I... I basically wrote Hugh a fan letter. <laughs> so I asked my agents, my, my, my family had, uh, had worked with Hugh before and, and loved him, but you know, somebody asked me this before and they were like, did you use that connection? I'm like, how weirded out would Hugh have been? It's like, I'm the wife of the brother of the director you once worked with. And I really like have time. It was like, this, that's not gonna go well. But what will go well is a crazy person fan letter to you talking about how I've written this script and only he will do. And then I was so high maintenance that I refused to send him the script. I was like, yeah, I'll just pop by. I'm just in the, in the neighborhood. I can pop by anytime. I was in LA, he was in New York. And so when he was like, <laughs> neat, I was like, you know, Travelocity, get me an overnight flight, get me to New York so I can pop by and tell him about the script. Um, and, but no, in, in all honesty, it was, it, it truly was, uh, I told my agents, I'm like, well, if it's not you, I'm not going to do it. And then no one's going to do it because I don't want anyone else to do it. Now. <laughs> and, so, and so they were like, you don't mean that. And I was like, no, I, I 100% mean that. So I'm glad you said yes. And, and you saying yes, um, it just, you know, to be basically a complete indie, we didn't have a studio, we didn't have anything like that. Um, and we just went to Berlin and having Q as an ally um, it made it a real for me, and I think certainly real for other people as well. Thank you for saying that, by the way. But you'd had that script sitting there for a while, like I before had. Westworld. I remember you telling me that. You said, "I know, I wrote it, but I know I won't be able to get it made. I need to have some runs on the board." I think you said, "I have to have something else, and then then I'll do it." Yeah. So you, yeah. you knew that in advance. When I wrote it, you know, the script was really well received again it was just a, on the open market so so there were a couple interested parties and with that i was able to leverage control over it you know so um in terms of just how it was presented as a as a producer which is something that not a lot of writers have um and just benefit of the bargain i guess and um and so because of that there were other people who at times wanted to do it but i never I don't think I ever really bought into their vision. And it took me a while to realize it was because I had such a specific vision of my own. Um, and even though, you know, I'm so grateful to them all for their interest and everything. I just, um, so it just kind of stayed with me for, for a long time and, and percolated that way. And then after I directed a Westworld, I was like, time to send a crazy letter to Hugh. <laughs> I'm glad he did. <laughs> What, one, of the, one of the things that the film does, um, it, it talks about what's going on with our environment without batting you over the head. Um, can you sort of talk about the, why you wanted that aspect, you know, you know what I mean, to showcase what probably is gonna be happening to our planet? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's a grounded film and I wanted people to really relate emotionally to it. And I didn't want it to be dystopian necessarily, but also, you know, part of, part of being a writer is you just soak up the world you live in and you understand there are elements you can't deny and you try to find ways to um, convey them without them being you know, necessarily divisive or depressing by, by basically presenting them as the facts that they are in a sort of matter of fact way. Like this is happening, there's no doubt. You know, It isn't a movie about that, but it's a movie that has to acknowledge that that is a part of this world now. And it's the same thing like when people ask about Westworld, like they talk about, were you responding to like 
the Me Too movement or whatever. And I'm like, no, like I've been that before that, but we all live in this world. We understand things that are happening in this world and they inform what we do. It doesn't mean, I don't like it when things are didactic, you know, to me, this is a love story and a thriller, um, but I wanted to ground it in reality. There was actually uh, articles while we were shooting, Steve. I can't remember where I was, but there was an article basically talking about Miami going to be a few feet underwater in 20 years. What, remember that? And also Venice was yeah. uh, some Mark Square was completely flooded. So it was sort of happening literally while we were shooting. Remember those giant dams that we would roll onto sets to block off the roads that, that Howard made? Um, now Miami, literally, I was looking at the New York Times, they have dams that look exactly like that, that they're actually using and building to stop the water. It was, it, it was a few weeks ago. They, it was a front page article. It's crazy. One of the things that I've learned about after talking to many different people in the industry is everyone likes to work a different way on set. Some actors like, you know, silence. Some actors love to have a good time. Some directors want silence on set and others are blasting music. What, for each of you, what surprised you about the way the other person worked? Or just if you want to share the way you like to work on set. Lisa's directed before and written a lot, but it was her first feature film and I was, I, I knew how prepared she was, so I was not surprised by that, but I was surprised at how much fun we had, how relaxed it was, how much laughter there was on set. I think a lot of the scenes were really intense. It is a love story. My character certainly has a very obsessive side and there was some really sort of emotional scenes, but the atmosphere on set was very relaxed. You and Tandaway and then with Rebecca and I, there was a lot of laughter. Um, everyone from crew knew exactly what they were doing. That, that sort of surprised me, I'll be honest. I love that. <laughs> That's how I like to work. I thought you were going to say you were surprised by how many hot dogs I could eat a day because I was up to like six. You know, yeah, they started opening so craft true. services early. Yeah. I remember you and Tandaway looking at me once and being like, how do you eat like that? <laughs> what is happening? You don't have to say yes when they bring them around. Like it don't, every time. <laughs> no, you do. That's, that's how I don't sleep. I'm fueled solely by, by hot dogs. Um, and no. the amount of times you sang. Baby Shark. You got it. There it is. Baby Shark was my go-to get amped thing. When there was no coffee available, I would sing Baby Shark do 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 Baby Shark do 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 Baby Shark do 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 because my kids would sing the song and it would get stuck in my head. And I knew, for instance, if we were losing light and I started to sing Baby Shark, it has a kind of frenetic tempo to it, but it's also incredibly annoying. So all the lighting people would work faster. Everybody would just really go because if nothing else, it would stop me from singing Baby Shark. Yeah. But Lisa, Steve, the first day of shooting, we were shooting the action sequence with Daniel in the bar, uh, with Tandaway being amazingly cool and stunts and a lot of things. And literally this, the first shot, one of the first shots of the film, we go into close up of Tandaway and there's dripping water coming down. We realize there's a massive leak and the roof is leaking in shot. So like that was day one. And then in the second or third week, the reminiscence machine, which is the first time, Lisa, you should talk about this by the way, because a lot of Steve's followers will love it, but it's the first time ever that kind of in-camera effect had ever been done, that whole hologram effect. And it was, a little difficult the first few days. Oh my God, God, it was a pain in the ass. But you, yeah, but you were surprisingly, supremely calm. Trust me, when I've seen directors, when things are going wrong and schedules seem to be blowing out in your first days, right? Which you didn't, by the way. I've seen people lose their shit completely and you never did. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, you know, the thing, the thing is about set from, from my part, the thing that surprised me, didn't really surprise me about Hugh. Like I could tell when we talked about the character, there were so many things that I wanted in Bannister. And there was a reason why I was drawn to him, right? Drawn to Hugh. Like I was like, he looks like a hero and he's this archetypal, heroic, handsome action star. But we're going to go on a journey that kind of peels back some of these ideas of what masculinity and what like the kind of noir ideas of, a hero and a villain are. We're going to try to modernize that and, and bring a little more nuance into it. And you're not always going to be necessarily the hero. It's not always going to be pretty, right? But if there is love there, that means it's going to be earned, right? Um, and he immediately got what I was talking about. And without any kind of vanity or thinking about, you know, a lot of actors, you know, they have to really think about oh, what's my image and what's this. And, and Hugh is 
essentially a character actor in an incredibly good looking package. <laughs> like it's, it's weird, um, but true, right? And and he's super Deb. I This is totally platonic Deb, but I am, you know, you marry him, you know what's up. Um, but the skill that he has in his physical acting, right? Like even like the way he walks, the tiniest little affects, you can tell he dials them in beforehand and he's just so specific and so skilled on everything. So the reason I was able to do this on this schedule and not lose my shit when things went wrong and things always go wrong with tech and weather and yada, 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 is because everybody, like Hugh was, he's in almost every scene. He has so much to do, so much action, so much dialogue, so much emotion, and he was always ready. And he would stay on set with me between takes to save time. He got half naked on a train in Miami for me to save time because we couldn't afford to stop and get a changing room. Sure. And it was like, you know, but it's that kind of collaboration that you can't make a film like this that attempts to have scope, but also be an original film without like the 110% support of, of your actors. And that's, that's the only reason I made it through. Some movies turn out so much better in the editing room than you can ever expect. In other movies, you're like, what happened? How did the film ultimately come together in the editing room? Was What were the battles you needed to overcome to sort of put it all together? The initial cut was long, as all initial cuts are, but I was working with Mark Yoshikawa, who's brilliant. And, you know, I, I liked working with him because he'd worked with both Malik and with Francis Lawrence, right? And I was like, well, I want to have the kind of artistry and the sensuality of some of Malik's work, that kind of quiet, unspoken uh, pace and beauty. But I also want to juxtapose it with, you know, adrenaline fueled, you know, awesomeness. And so to be able to combine those two flavors, I knew I needed an, an editor who, who could really speak both languages. And Mark was perfect at that. Um, you know, I, I, I feel like when I'm writing, um, I tend to have, well, here you can speak to this, like I tend to have the scenes pre-cut in my head a lot of the time, um, like blocked out. And the way we shot this, especially because of the holocaust, um, the, the, because we did the hologram practically, I had to shoot those scenes beforehand, also imagining the composition of the final, what I call the turducken, when that scene was playing and he was orbiting around it. So composition would be something that you couldn't see in camera because you had to imagine in the future um, how everything was going to lay out. So, it, it, you know, happily for, for, for this project, it was good to have, um, have that penchant for editing it together in my head. And then, you know, of course, with Mark's artistry, we found all sorts of new and beautiful things to add to it. But I generally do keep a cut in my head that stays pretty true. There's a quite, I, it's now famous on set. Is it online? I don't know, Lisa, but there's a very famous sort of, <laughs> in my head, it's like a split screen, right? Of Lisa on the set of Westworld talking through with the crew, it must be the day before or the morning of. So it's without the actors, but explaining to everyone how this gunfight action scene is going to go down. And it's like savant, fast, quick, explaining the plot, the emotional thing. And you're going to catch that over there. We're going to get an up shot. We move around here. We go back. And it's over to Ed Harris, who's going to look. We're going to do a close up. We go back. And she's moving through the entire scene, explaining it. And everyone's just taking notes. It's about two minutes long. And next to it is the actual finished cut scene. It's exactly as described in like the best two minute monologue you've ever heard. So Lisa's not joking when she says it's kind of pre-cut. But were there things that surprised you, Hugh, when you saw it in the end? Were there, were you like, wait a second? No, when you were thinking, I was, I was just, I really got very few surprises at all. I think, obviously, you know, the scope of the world was something that was really fun to see. And, and by the way, I encourage anyone watching this, if you have an opportunity to see it at an IMAX, see it. Because it's a big film and it's really big and beautiful. And it was lovely to see all of that. I've gone back again, I'm not answering your question, but... I, I've never had an experience as an actor being on set with the reminiscence machine, how beautiful that was. That existed for real. It is photographed in camera. And as an actor, I'm standing there watching this thing. There's some of the best acting I did in the movie was just looking like, oh, this is every day I go to work in this machine. It's another day, you know, and da da da, you know, because it was one of the most beautiful things I ever saw. But no, not too many surprises. It was amazing on the day watching you interact with it. I mean, the reason, 
you know, Steve, the, when we started this, I, I think I, thank, thankfully I have this incredible crew who is, I suppose, as masochistic as I am. Cause I was like, we are going to make this machine. And they're like, that doesn't exist. If holograms existed, they would be all over the place in this world. They are fiction. And I was like, yeah, but they can be real enough to be shot in camera, you know? And so dimensionalizing it the way that we had to holograms have been filmed in a sort of planar way before, right? Where you kind of look, but it's more two dimensional, but we wanted to be able to interact with it and circle it in three dimensions, right? And also to do it in camera. And so that, because Hugh, so much of your, so many reveals happen and so much actual emotion has to happen that it would be very hard to have done it without that because even the eyeline would have constantly changed because we would have had to, we couldn't have just used a tennis ball, right? We would have to like move the tennis ball and make the tennis ball go all over the place. So we had no choice but to, but to contend with that crazy, <laughs> crazy stuff. Hugh, before, because I'm, I'm out of time, but I am curious, of the films that you've made, which of them do you think changed the most in the editing room versus what you thought you were making, if any? X-Men 1. <laughs> that makes sense. A week, I'm probably speaking out of school, Steve, but a week before I came out, I think it was 47 minutes longer. Wait, What? Wow. A week? Uh, I may be exaggerating or under exaggerating. It was a lot. Like, and, and the, maybe the week is an exaggeration, but I certainly, this, what we shot, I remember going, what happened to that scene and that character? Wait, wait, whoa. And that movie from memory is about 100 minutes, I think. Wow. Um, it was a lot longer. A lot longer. So that was <laughs> definitely a big surprise to me. It, it, Release the full cut. <laughs> you know, you know what's interesting about that though? And I don't think people are going to remember. And again, I know I have to go. Um, but that was when the superhero genre was not what it is now. That film was one of the one of the reasons the superhero genre exists today. And it, people won't remember, but the studio was not enthusiastic about it in the way that. They are now. That was like a battle to yep. get that film made. Oh, yeah. And to get it out. And there were battles all the way through, for sure. And I remember people who I knew in Hollywood, not my age, not Patrick, and not anyone at the studio, but two or three other people who were in the know were like, dude, I finished in February and it came out July. They were like, make sure you got another job. Like the word on the street is this thing is a dud. And it's okay, you're, you're a lead. at the moment, you're a lead in a movie in Hollywood, right? No one, don't tell them it's a comic book. That means nothing. Just say you're, you're a lead in the movie and you're at least going to get auditions and then try and book something before it comes out and they give you one more shot. That was, I remember getting that advice. I'm like, all right, let's get auditioning. Oh. <laughs> and how, how raw, well, I mean, listen, uh, I heard before Mad Max Fury Road came out that the film was a mess. People were like bad mouthing it and look what that movie turned into. You know, yeah. like every sometimes the buzz on the street is so not true. Never bet against George Miller. Never. Thank you both so much for talking with me. And, you know, I wish you guys nothing but the best in this film. And uh, the fact is that uh, I do think that in this moment, you guys coming out on in theaters and HBO Max is actually um, a good thing even though I know you'd rather people see it in theatrical, just because there's a lot of people that don't feel safe going to a theater. And I think that people will watch it. You, you know yeah. what I mean? As yeah. long as people feel safe and are safe watching it, you know, then I'm happy if they watch it. I'm happy if anybody connects to it. I will be hiding somewhere, actually. That's what's going to happen. So I'm going to go hide. If anybody knows any good hidey holes, I'm, I'm looking for one. Casa Vega, Ventura Boulevard in uh, Los Angeles. It's kind of close to my house, but we can try. <laughs> <laughs>